Good morning, good afternoon. Thank you all for joining us uh, for the third and final day of AGSIW's seventh annual Petro Diplomacy Conference. Uh, today's session is titled Geopolitics and the Future of the OPEC Plus Alliance. And we have a wonderful group of experts joining us to help us uh, take a deep dive into these topics. I'll briefly introduce them here and then share their full bios in the chat with all of you. Uh, I'd like to welcome um, our good friend and, and non-resident fellow at AGSIW, Kate Dorian. Uh, she's also a contributing editor at the Middle East Economic Survey and a fellow at the Energy Institute. Uh, previously, she was the regional manager for the Middle East and Gulf states at the World Energy Council, as well as the program officer for the Middle East and North Africa and the Global Energy Relations Division of the International Energy Agency. Also with us is Lee Chen Sim, uh, assistant professor at Khalifa University of Science and Technology in Abu Dhabi and a non-resident scholar uh, at the Middle East Institute. She is a specialist in the political economy of Russian and Gulf energy and its intersection with international relations. Her interests include the politics of renewable and nuclear energy in the Middle East, Gulf Asia exchanges, Russia-China relations in the Middle East, and Russia-Gulf interactions. Also with us is our very good friend, Karen Young, a senior fellow and the founding director of the program on economics and energy at the Middle East Institute. Previously, she was a resident scholar at the American Enterprise Institute, focusing on the political economy of the Middle East and the member states of the Gulf Cooperation Council. Before AEI, she uh, was a senior resident scholar at AGSIW, a research and visiting fellow at the Middle East Center of the London School of Economics and Political Science, and Assistant Professor of Political Science at the American University in Sharjah and the UAE. Moderating the session today is Ambassador Bill Roebuck, the Executive Vice President of AGSIW. He most recently served as a Deputy Special Envoy to the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS and a Senior Advisor to the Special Representative for Syria Engagement. He served as the US Ambassador to Bahrain from 2015 to 2017. Uh, before we start, um, I wanted to also remind everyone, if you haven't seen it yet, um, I wanted to flag the seat <clears throat> for this conference uh, authored by uh, Kate, um, Gulf countries gear up for a net zero world. Um, I'll share that also with, with the chat uh, with all of you before uh, we get started. And with that, Ambassador Robach, over to you. Thank you, Raymond. Thank you for those introductions. Welcome, everyone. Delighted to be here with you today with such an illustrious group of experts on the oil industry and energy markets as we close this year's Petro Diplomacy Conference. Our panel today focuses on geopolitics and the future of OPEC Plus. We'll pay attention to stresses on the organization, its performance, and key dynamics inside and outside the group. Members of the panel will also focus on the energy transition to a net zero world that Gulf countries and the rest of the world are having to gear up for. Of course, we all have our eyes on Glasgow and the COP26 gathering there at the end of this month. So we'll also uh, have that as a, as a focus when we speak about the transition. Please feel free and I welcome you to weigh in with questions through the chat function as Raymond uh, indicated. But uh, first things first, and let me keep my throat clearing to a relative minimum here. I wanted to say just that the OPEC plus group came together in 2016, primarily in response to the oil price shock of 2014 and 15. Uh, remarkably, really, it's, it's endured given the diverse interests of its 23 members and the incredibly difficult challenges in particular posed by the 2020 outbreak of the coronavirus uh, pandemic and the collapse of oil demand. These developments led the group, as, as we all know, to implement production cuts of nine, almost 10 million barrels of uh, oil per day last April. And they are uh, working to uh, progressively put uh, that oil back on the market. Um, panelists, um, we're coming out of a pandemic that has tested the uh, institution of OPEC+. Plus. I wanted to ask each of you uh, how you think that the organization performed in handling this collapsing demand by controlling supply. What forces most uh, stressed it and are likely to stress it in the future? And how durable and cohesive do you think OPEC Plus is likely to be? Um, 
I wonder, Professor uh, Li Chen, if you would like to start that discussion and then we'll give everyone a, a crack at it. Thank you very much, Bill. Um, I'd be pleased to um, uh, go first. Uh, so, uh, you, you know, you asked a series of questions about uh, the durability of OPEC Plus and its sustainability. I think I'll be the first one to admit that I was surprised that the OPEC Plus has actually lasted for as long as it has. Um, I have a uh, Russian politics background, and so I was actually quite skeptical. Uh, you know, continue, but it has, and uh, it has actually done pretty well. And um, I think that there are several reasons uh, for why the um, alliance has uh, sustained itself. Um, obviously, one of the big reasons was um, the threat of uh, shale oil, which basically pushed um, the two sides together. Um, I'm not going to talk so much about why uh, it has stayed together, but I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, Russia and about whether I think, because I think Russia is one of the big factors clearly in the OPEC plus alliance. And if you indulge me, I'm just going to, you know, uh, two points, two really quick points about uh, Russia and OPEC plus. Um, first question is, you know, um, has it been hitting its targets? Because, um, you know, given all the high oil prices now, I think it's quite an important question. Um, has it been hitting its targets? Um, well, occasionally yes, occasionally no. Um, as some of you know, it used to uh, uh, produce over 11 million barrels a day, but it has gone down since, and it has been quite hard pressed at times, um, at most times, to hit its um, targets uh, under the OPEC plus. So um, do, in the short term, though, I think that it will still sporadically be able to hit some targets, um, particularly if it fudges the um, condensate issue. Um, it, it could hit some of its targets now and then. But um, I think what's quite worrying is in the longer term, um, I'm, I'm not totally convinced um, that it will always be able to hit its targets, assuming it, it continues to stay in OPEC+. Plus. So if we look at the longer term, like over the next three years, I know we could see some declines in, in Russian production because of the, um, the brown fields. Um, they are um, deteriorating. I'm not sure there's enough investment and sanctions issue. So I think that um, one flag here is um, Russia's role in OPEC plus. It's, it's a bit of a red flag. Thank you, Li Chen. Um, I appreciate you uh, taking it in that direction. Um, Karen? Sure. Well, thank you so much. It's really good to be back as a part of an AGSIW event. So I uh, really appreciate that. Um, I would first say, you know, the, the pandemic's not over, right? I mean, we are still, we're seeing actually new announcements of lockdowns in Russia today. Um, China's growth is, is really, I think, slower than many might have anticipated or expected. And the chairman of DP World said recently it would take up to two years to get supply chains sort of back in order. So we're still very much in a period of disruption. But then in terms of OPEC plus, I would say actually we owe OPEC plus and Saudi Arabia probably a very big thank you. Um, you know, when we think about international consensus and the ability to manage energy markets, we've experienced some incredible shocks um, really since late 2014, then the COVID shock in 2020, and now this moment of the global economy sort of sputtering and, and coming back to life um, with some you know, really long lasting disruptions uh, to supply chains and, and, and figuring out what demand looks like. Um, this, is a, this is an awkward time. You know, the moments of tension were obvious, you know, first between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia on shale in 2014, 2015, mm -hmm. then between Russia and Saudi Arabia in March and April of 2020, and then within, you know, the Gulf producers between Saudi Arabia and the UAE um, and just this summer. So, you know, there have been um, definitely moments of, of tension and, and perhaps, you know, even threats to the breakdown of the agreement. But in general, I mean, the shared goal of OPEC plus is a reliable stream of hydrocarbon revenue. Um, they wanna meet customer demand and they wanna avoid a disruption to global growth. And so that's why, you know, I think they've, um, 
ended up in points of consensus. And, you know, and that is sometimes been hard to arrive at, but generally has gotten us to a, a, a moment of market management. Mm -hmm. The problem, I think, is that we're in very much a three-way struggle, right? So first, we're pulled in a general energy transition that requires greater policy cohesion, which we don't really have. So OPEC plus, you could say, as a model, has worked better than some of our international fora and agreements um, on energy issues. Um, the second is a shift in the investment cycle in energy in both traditional hydrocarbons and in renewables. And then a massive disruption to where and how we consume energy. Some of that is COVID related, but some of it is much longer and broader trends about the move of where demand will be for energy, mostly in emerging markets, right? And so the shift from uh, the North to the South, this is very much part of our transition in the moment. And so if you think about OPEC plus, it's an organization that is very much in the voice of for many, those, those elements of those South-South flows. And I think we'll, maybe we can talk about that later. But uh, you know, in, in general, I think it's been, um, it's been an organization with the additional members that has uh, provided stability in moments of extreme shock. Thanks, thanks, Karen. You've given us a lot to, to chew on there. There's some uh, good observations. Perhaps we can come back to a few of them. Um, Kate, welcome. It's really good to see you. Um, I wonder if you'd like to take a crack at this first question about OPEC Plus and um, the stresses it's under, challenges it might face. Yeah, thank you, Bill. And, and you know, I am a last minute um, entrant because uh, my very learned friend, Bassam Fatra, couldn't make it. Um, so I, I'm going to have to look at my notes. But I would I, I agree with, with both, both speakers about the fact that OPEC Plus has surprised many by being um, quite cohesive. There have been a few ups and downs, but let's not forget that the agreement between Russia and Saudi Arabia came after a very bruising battle for market share. And if you look at, for example, demand from China, if you look at China's imports, um, Saudi Arabia and Russia are neck to neck. Um, you also see Iraq trying to sort of muscle in. They recently sold a cargo into the US of, of, of one of their lighter crude streams because they discounted it against Saudi crude. So I think for now, their interests converge. You've got these producers and OPEC alone could no longer manage the market. I think it was a realization. And it was there were previous attempts to bring Russia on board that failed. And it was in 2016 that there was a concerted effort to say, come on, you know, we need, you had had two years of, uh, of ups and downs, oil prices falling, you know, going up to 178, coming down to 30. So there was a shock, which we're still feeling today. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a realization that Russia had to be brought on board and other producers had to contribute because OPEC alone was, its market share was shrinking. So if you look ahead, I think there may be tensions when the share of oil in the global energy mix is starts to shrink. I mean, if you look at the demand forecasts, they're all over the place, you know, mm -hmm. IE is net zero, sees demand at a quarter of what it is, um, what it was in, in 2019. If you look at OPEC's own projections for 2045, demand for oil is going to be exactly where we are today, you know, about 99 million barrels. So, uh, you know, OPEC's share might grow, but in a much smaller market. And I think that's where, and, and again, the pull is going to be from Asia. So I think that's where we might see some competition. Shale is no longer, I think Russia for now, I mean, we heard President Putin say oil prices could hit, hit 100. In the past, I think the Russians were very worried about US shale coming back and taking market share from them. China, as we heard in yesterday's gas panel, is absorbing a lot of LNG from the US. They're, they're busy um, securing gas. Um, but um, I think that's no longer because the, the whole shale play in the US has actually changed. You know, there's more discipline. Uh, there isn't that sort of profligate high debt that we see um, accumulated before, you know, before the um, before 2020. So I think that may happen in the, in the future. But for now, I think, yes, it, uh, it took a big shock. It took prices going down below zero in, in the US for these countries to come together. And, um, and I think it will hold for now. Demand is slowly picking up. And the caution that you see at the moment is because of all the uncertainty that Karen referred to. You know, we just don't know what's going to happen. There may be a surplus. I mean, the UK now is saying, hey, you know, we may have to 
um, we may have to impose new restrictions because COVID cases are rising. So I think that's why they're being ultra cautious. And Russia says, whatever Saudi says, we'll go along with. I mean, that's the level of, of cooperation mm -hmm. we're seeing between the two sides. Hmm. Kate, if I could just ask you a, a, a follow-up uh, question. Um, in terms of uh, OPEC um, maintaining current levels of tapering um, previous mm -hmm. production cuts and allowing about 400,000 uh, new barrels of oil onto the market. Do you think that's going to um, continue? Or, I mean, you've alluded to it a little bit, but give me your sense about how likely it is they're going to be able to maintain that through their the end of their um, scheduled um, uh, interventions each month, I think in September of next year. Yeah, I mean, uh, if, if you look at the latest IEA um, oil market report, it basically says, you know, it, as they ramp up production, their spare capacity cushion is... Um, is eroding a little bit. It was 9 million, now it's coming down. It'll be 5 million barrels a day of spare capacity in the first quarter of next year, and then down to 4 million barrels a day. Then that also impacts the price, you know, because as your spare capacity cushion shrinks, if you have any outages like we had in the Gulf of Mexico, or um, then, you know, that supports the price. But I think the fact that a lot of the countries are not, are not able to produce at their new quotas, so you've got the ones who have the spare capacity are Saudi Arabia, UAE, Kuwait, and Iraq. Um, so I think um, that sort of, uh, Iran is still out of the picture. You've got mm -hmm. outages, Libya is not at full capacity. So I think the geopolitics, you know, the geopolitical conflicts in the region or the um, the uh, instability is actually helping uh, so that you have this um, window. Um, I don't think they can increase by much more because they, if you look at the numbers, there's a lot of countries that are below their quotas simply because they can't produce at the higher quota. Mm. Angola for one. Right. Um, Karen, a, a related question. Um, so um, in your in your sense of it, is the oil market now um, balanced as some in OPEC plus uh, assert, or is there a supply deficit? Um, we hear talk about an energy crunch in China, an energy crunch in um, other places, Europe, um, India, just uh, your, your assessment of uh, sort of the oil market. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, you know, I would say that a lot of the um, the the blackouts and the you know the the kind of lack of supply, particularly of gas that we're seeing in in Europe and 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 China's kind of ramp up of buying a lot of gas on the market. Um, there are a lot of factors that why we're seeing these uh, these hiccups right now, right? So it's not um, not necessarily just about oil or oil production. It's you know there's kind of a lot going on there, and it's not. Um, well, I guess there are a lot of reasons, you know, there's the thesis that this is about, you know, in gas markets, a long term kind of underinvestment in that sector. Um, in oil, it's, you know, you know, this kind of recalibrating as we get through the pandemic and figuring out how OPEC plus will be able to, um, you know, uh, put 400,000 barrels per day back onto the market in this kind of graduated schedule. Um, but it's it's actually all things sort of combined and then actually things like weather and things like, um, you know, just uh, disruptions to production for technology reasons, not something that are, you know, um, not really having to do with the energy transition necessarily. So it's it's just, it's, you know, what Liam Denon called, you know, tantrums, tween tantrums in the market. Um, this is part mm -hmm. of it, but it's, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, I think the, the bigger issue, frankly, is that we're not seeing a whole lot of uh, policy cohesion, um, and this really being led by um, the you know the UN agencies and the COP26 uh, meetings and and our and our own I think domestic lack of American sort of leadership in in where we go forward in the management of energy markets and this transition. So I think that is actually the the bigger problem and what will stay with us for many more years to come. We're in a strange moment right now that has a lot of reasons for why we're seeing problems. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, the, the bigger issue is that we're probably facing 
a real lack of consensus and policy cohesion on all kinds of issues, not just on emissions targets, but on the idea of, uh, you know, of carbon tax and uh, on the idea of, um, you know, supplying uh, concessional finance for clean energy uh, and electricity production in emerging markets. We, you know, we don't have real one-stop shopping for where the ideas and the solutions are going to come from. Um, mm -hmm. And that's causing a lot of the, I think, the tensions and the misreadings uh, within markets and, and why it's been so hard to, um, to get to um, more shared solutions. Thanks, Karen. Um, Li Chen, just to follow up uh, on um, the remarks um, that uh, I believe it was uh, Kate was making um, about um, Russia's perceptions um, on American U.S. shale, um, and it maybe there's not as much concern about um, the U.S. taking market share. Um, what is what is your sense of that, and of Russia's? Uh, uh, you mentioned you talked about it a little bit, but anything else you wanted to say about Russia's energy ambitions? Sure. Um, yes, I, I think that. Uh, uh, most uh, well, Russians are quite pleased, if you like, about uh, the state of the uh, U.S. shale industry. It's it's not that it's I mean it, it's always in the background that if oil prices stay high for a sustained period of time, then you have that that threat still coming back. That say if one year from now, if oil is at ninety dollars and above, who knows, right? Um, they, they could come back. We, Russia doesn't know that. We don't know that. Um, there were some uh, U.S. pundits which were saying that $85 um, a barrel of oil for a sustained period of time, and you may see more shale coming back. So I guess that's something that's in the back of their minds, um, given the, the zero, you know, zero dollar prices that we had in, in 2020. Mm -hmm. So I think that's in the back of the mind. But yes, you're right. I think that's kind of just, you know, j just in the back of the mind. Um, and Russia, of course, is quite well positioned in terms of the fiscal break even um, for its next few years. Um, its budget will break even at below fifty dollars um, oil, oil at below fifty dollars, and this is in contrast to the Gulf states where the fiscal break even, um, if you believe in that kind of thing, um, it's going to be you know something between about sixty to seventy five dollars depending on you know which Gulf state you're looking at. So in that sense, Russia has a little bit more cushion, um, if you like. Um, it can afford you know oil prices to to dip a little. Mm -hmm. um, so 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 that's one thing that you know that, that Russia will be you know I guess not unhappy to see oil prices come down a little. Um, so 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 that would be um, my perspective of that. Um, does Russia have any extra oil ambitions? Um, sure, it's um, competing, as um, the other panelists have mentioned, um, competing with the Saudis in China, for example. Um, they're competing um, in the Indian market as well. Um, don't forget that lots of Russian companies are quite active in Iraq, and Iraq is a big um, exporter um, of oil to India. So, so there is lots of competition for that smaller market, even in Europe. So I think it's both a story of competition as well as coordination um, in terms of um, Russia's oil ambitions. And of course, um, OPEC is one of the ways in which Russia you know, kind of like solidifies its, its global reach. So um, I'm sure that it will not like uh, OPEC, OPEC plus to fail because that's one of its multilateral um, outreach um, areas. Um, as well, you know, uh, oil prices can't go too low for Russia because, you know, it, it's the revenues, right? Um, it's too important for budget revenues, but half of Russia's budget revenues come from there. So, you know, there are both geopolitical reasons as well as, you know, financial reasons um, why, you know, Russia would kind of, it wouldn't mind, you know, if the oil prices come down a bit lower, mm -hmm. um, but I think if it rises much too high, uh, that would be a bit of discomfort. Um, as well, I think the last thing I'll mention is that Russia uh, is trying to produce greenfield sites um, in the Russian oil industry in, um, in, in, in the north, in the Arctic. So that would also support, you know, slightly higher um, oil price. So you have a lot of factors pushing Russia, right? You have some oil, some companies which want to higher oil prices. You've got a budget that can, you know, subsist on slightly lower um, oil prices. So, you know, that's where your push and pull uh, factors are in Russia. Thank you, Li Chen. Um, Kate, uh, OPEC plus countries 
are, you alluded to it in your um, remarks, are struggling. I think Karen also um, referred to it. Some of them are struggling to meet their quotas for increased production. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a sense about what you think uh, caused this and um, how significant is it? Is it just, this is just the normal wear and tear of the oil uh, energy, energy industry, or is it a, a harbinger of um, the energy transition that we've entered now um, and where things are likely to head? I think it started before the, the transition. I think a lot of it was, I mean, if you look at the country like Algeria, they've had so many different changes of government and minister mm -hmm. and, um, and, and a structure that, uh, you know, a governance structure that that hasn't really attracted the necessary investment. You've had um, issues. Angola was uh, has has difficult geology. You know a lot of offshore, mm -hmm. and I think uh, it it didn't help that there was this steep decline. You know, two years of decline in, in between 2014 and 2016 in upstream investment. So I think that's playing out now, mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, you look at Iraq, for example, which was sort of this big promising. I mean, Iraq is going is now the second biggest producer in OPEC, and it's going to be possibly one of the few countries where you are going to have a surge in capacity between now and 2030. But, um, you know, you see Exxon leaving, you've seen Shell leave already, you've seen a reluctance. Uh, I mean, Total Energies just went in, but it was more of a sort of hybrid deal where they combined oil and gas. They're not making a big thing about oil. And of course, you know, getting... Um, getting financing for, for oil and gas for fossil fuel uh, projects is getting harder and harder. And the cost of, of um, financing these projects is, is getting higher because of ESG. And if you have to decarbonize, it's also becoming quite costly. So 2020, a lot of countries took a big hit and mm -hmm. that's going to take time you know, to recover. So um, it's, um, it's a legacy of bad management, bad, you know, poor returns, fiscal returns, as was the case in Iraq. Now they're amending their terms. Um, they're even creating a new uh, national oil company, maybe a bit mm -hmm. too late, as, as we heard earlier. Um, but unless they try to find a way of, of, com of, of diversifying their economies, they're going to be badly hit. So, um, uh, the, the, you know, the, you have companies like Aramco, which do have um, the ability to decarbonize their, their oil and gas, but it's, it's being driven by consumers. Um, you know, so carbon capture and storage, yes, but it has to be developed at scale. It's going to be costly. And if you're looking at projections of demand peaking, maybe by 2030, maybe beyond, um, according to some, some forecasts, then the incentive to not invest is, is quite strong. But again, if you don't have CCS and you're going to end up with stranded assets. So there's, um, you know, but it's not purely the transition. I think the transition will accelerate this sort of pull away from, from uh, hydrocarbons projects, but it started way before that. Thanks, Kate. Uh, let me ask a, a couple of questions um, about OPEC plus relations with, um, with other uh, countries and how that um, is, is affecting the organization. Um, several of you have talked about uh, the U.S. Um, and its uh, entry in the last decade as a energy, a real uh, exporting uh, energy producer. And um, I wonder, um, I, I'll let this be a toss up and let uh, somebody grab it, but if someone would like to talk about the, the geopolitical implications of, uh, of China its relations with uh, OPEC plus and um, its evolution over the last decade um, as um, the now becoming the largest consumer of, uh, of uh, oil in the, in the Middle East. Um, I don't know, Kate or uh, Lee Chen, if you'd like to um, say a few words about that. I'll say one word very quickly about the, the recent uh, SPR release, and I'm sure Lee Chen can, can elaborate and say a lot more on it, but there was a, a recent, um, China tested their, um, their strategic reserves, which they've been building um, for a while. They're, they're not a member of the IA, so they're not obliged to hold 90 days of socks, but they've been building it up. And of course, you know, it's, it's, it's quite a huge number when you look at it, um, 300 million or something barrels. But the, uh, the release was more 
designed to test the system, which is quite new. They've never tested it before. I mean, the US has strategic um, reserves that they, they release when necessary. It's not meant to be a price. Um, uh, uh, it's not supposed to be a mechanism to, to, to manage price. Mm -hmm. If prices go too high, you release stocks. And, but um, I think it was also a message to OPEC. It's like, hang on, you know, we're, we, we are, you know, we are big buyers of oil. So um, it, it wasn't sort of, it wasn't said, but I think it was implied that China does have the power now. India is not happy with with current prices. You know, they're at three year highs in the US at one point, they're at seven year highs. So I think they have to be really careful how they, you know, the, the, the net zero train is on the move. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you're not going to stop it. Now, it may be that the ambition is a bit, you know, too, too ambitious, the, right. the, the targets are too ambitious, but it's it's moving ahead. You know, there's no way you're going to, to go back. Uh, emissions are rising at the same time. Um, so I, I think that you have to be aware that the consumer now has choice. You know, we have choices in, in the type of electricity that we want to, to supply our homes, the type of car we want to buy. So I think that that is that is something that they have to be aware of. And you can't assume China used to be not so sensitive to price. They were filling their strategic reserve when it was $100 oil and, yeah. and when it was 30. So I think now it's sort of, the, 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 it's, an, it's an economy that's maturing. And I think they are having growing pains as we've seen now, you know, the Chinese economy uh, has hit a few bumps. Um, so I think the, the producers have to be a bit careful and be a bit more sensitive to the needs of the consumers. They talk about, you know, the IEF being producer-consumer dialogue, but at the end of the day, um, I don't think it goes beyond this sort of the talking. Thank you, Kate. Li Chen, anything you'd like to add about uh, China and its relations with OPEC plus or the, the dynamic there? Sure, um, um, as I mentioned before, um, I think there's a kind of competition, uh, well, friendly competition, I'd say, um, between the Gulf states and Russia for these key markets, whether it's India or China. Um, you have the Saudis um, buying stakes in Chinese refineries uh, in order to lock in the demand for its um, crude. So obviously that's a, it's a pretty smart strategy and with the money the Saudis can do it. Um, you don't really see the Russians doing that. Um, mm -hmm. Perhaps it's a, you know, it's a function of finances, um, but certainly the Saudis are doing that and that's a good strategy um, to lock in the crude demand. Um, so I think that we will we'll probably see um, a bit more of that, um, them buying a bit more stakes in refineries, whether it's in China or even in India, where UAE and the Saudis were thinking of um, building a big refinery where they have stakes. So I think we'll see these are quite um, good strategies, but they're really, really expensive as well. And there's a question of whether you know, um, they can actually afford that. Um, but if we move away from China, since you were talking about geopolitics, Bill, um, I, and I will extend Kate's point here about customer demand in Europe, right? So the Europeans with their Fit for 50 um, green plan, that's also something that Russia needs to look out for. Um, mm. Because now, um, you know, the Europeans are going to demand less oil, less gas and less coal. So, you know, and, and, and these uh, three, oil, gas, and coal, are key energy exports um, uh, for Russia into Europe. And, and for Europe, um, you know, it, ex it imports lots of that from Russia. So um, Russia is also going to have to make sure that it doesn't overplay its hand because um, the Europeans, you know, they, they will eventually have options in terms of uh, renewable energy, uh, in terms of um, a hydrogen strategy to, to reduce um, the demand in, in, in these kinds of fossil fuels from Russia. So um, geopolitically, then it's, it's, it's um, you know, OPEC has to, OPEC plus has to keep an eye both on China, I guess, as well as um, Europe, um, because these are key customers, um, you know, key energy customers. Thanks. Thanks, Li Chin. Um, I, I have a question from um, the audience about um, Iran and if there's a, a, an, an agreement on its nuclear program um, and it's allowed to re-enter the oil market, um, how will OPEC plus uh, accommodate that uh, re-entry? Any, any issues um, you see um, in that um, development? Um, Karen, you want to tackle, tackle that or Kate? I can try and start. Okay. Um, 
I mean, I think that's been the whole the whole issue, really, in the disagreement in, in July of, of how much uh, to increase quotas, how much to put back on markets, was this sense that perhaps by this point in the year, the Biden administration would have gotten um, more along the path towards re-entering the JCPOA and uh, towards sanctions relief on uh, Iran's oil exports. We're not there. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I think now there's a bit more of a consideration that, okay, maybe that's not going to happen. Um, Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, whatever the plan B is, which no one seems to understand, um, will be next. So what does Iran do? It continues to uh, to get oil to markets, mostly to China. Um, And then the, you know, the the Biden administration reaction Um, has been actually somewhat similar to what happened under the Trump administration, which is a little bit fearful to go after China um, for continuing to to buy Iranian oil because you need China's cooperation on on other issues. Um, Now this has become a bit of a political football in uh, Republican versus Democratic politics in in the United States um, Mm -hmm. with Republicans like Nikki Haley coming after the Biden administration saying, oh, why aren't you pushing harder on China? Um, but actually, the Trump administration kind of did the same thing, right? So, um, you know, this is, I think, a little bit of that tantrum and tweenishness of this year, in where OPEC Plus has tried to kind of anticipate the reentry of Iran, um, mm-hmm. and and it keeps getting a bit pushed forward. <laughs> um, so I guess uh, you know we're we're not going to be there, but that's not really. That's not really the, the longer term issue either. I think, you know, mm-hmm. OPEC plus what they want is to have uh, a stable market for their product. And they realize this is a product that will be declining or plateauing in demand soon, 10 years, 15 years, whatever. And so the, the worry in that intermediate stage, and, you know, this is part of the, the pandemic, pandemic fallout as well, is that we're seeing, you know, a real threat to global growth. And that's not great for these producers either. We're getting a lot of inflationary pressures. We're getting perhaps a, a slowdown um, in uh, in the demographics of the, mm-hmm. the West, right? Mm-hmm. We're going to be living in a, a higher tax uh, kind of environment, maybe less consumption of these products. So there's just so many considerations and you don't want to have the stranded assets, right? So you want to get this product to market quickly at a price that um, is uh, you know somewhat moderate and that helps all of our global growth and recovery um, be sustained. Um, And that's a tall order, right? And so that's why, again, I would go back to the point of why um, perhaps more um, consensus and uh, and, uh, US leadership could be useful on this point. That's a great point. Um, I think we'll probably um, find ways in the course of the discussion this morning to come back to it. Although I I suspect it's uh, relatively resistant to um, solution in, in, in many ways. Um, Kate, did you want to say anything about the um, re-entry of, um, of Iran or related um, OPEC plus one issues? Yeah, I, th- I, I saw a report recently that said, you know, China's likely to, because prices are so high and Iran, I mean, they have been buying Iranian oil, some of it disguised as Omani or, you know, some other kind of oil. Um, and obviously Iran is discounting its oil in order to, to, to sell it. And they'll probably discount it more because, um, you know, if China's upset about the high oil price and, and it does have interest in Iran, then, um, you know, they might. And that may be a strategy for Iran going forward if it does come back to the market. It's not going to be in the first half of the year. So I think, you know, that OPEC was sort of expecting, OPEC and the IEA are saying, you know, that there may be a, uh, a surplus particularly if you have more lockdowns and if, you know, COVID is still going to be with us and mobility Mm -hmm. is restricted, then um, you might get a surplus, which is why they're maintaining this sort of very cautious approach to supply. But if if Iran is to come back in the second half of the year, I mean, one way they could get around it. I mean, they have accommodated countries that have been outside. You know, Iraq was accommodated. Uh, It was not part of the process system until it was able to build its its production after uh, after the war. So I think one way of avoiding having to do the calculation and, you know, new baselines and new quotas is to say, okay, you know, we'll give Iran, uh, you know, time to, to build up its, um, its position in the market again, keep it outside the quota, 
which it is at the moment, and they're actually producing, you know, mm. more than two million barrels a day. So there isn't that much more to go, um, because I think it's going to take time to ramp up. But they will probably try to compete on price. Um, you know, the Gulf states tend to follow the Saudi pricing. Um, system. So mm -hmm. Saudis come up with their official prices first and the others kind of follow, uh, whereas Iran isn't, isn't like that. So I think, and again, the competition will be in Asia, which is their main market. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, that's a good, uh, I think, once around on OPEC plus issues. Um, we can come back to it. I think I might try to steer the conversation a bit now towards uh, a broader consideration of energy transition that we're in. Um, people signaled at the beginning the importance of the continuing pandemic, the fact that it's not over, but we're also in, a, in the midst of another crisis of even greater dimensions, the climate change um, crisis, which is profoundly reshaping the energy landscape. Now we've had the advantage and privilege of hearing the other panels for petro diplomacy, uh, this week, um, we've had the chance to digest Kate's wonderful um, scene setter on these issues. I wonder, um, Karen, in um, speaking about the energy transition that Kate uh, lays out so well in her her, her paper, would you how would you describe the energy transition that we're in the midst of? Is it primarily uh, an institutional challenge, a technological? Uh, challenge. You've mentioned uh, the political challenge or sets of political and policy challenges, um, a resource challenge, or is it a contest between uh, quick starter oil producer countries who get ahead in their energy transition and those who are slow to um, take up that challenge? How, which part of that uh, would you emphasize in, in talking about the energy transition we're in the midst of? Thanks, Bill, and, and thank you to Kate for your excellent paper. I really enjoyed reading it as well. Um, you know, this week, I think you've had some, some really great discussions in the Petro Diplomacy Conference, and, and there are lots of conferences going on. We're all kind of grappling with these, um, these issues now, and it's interesting how much attention it's getting, um, whereas a year ago, <laughs> in a previous administration in the US, this was not, you know, part of our kind of day-to-day -day dialogue, but now it is. So mm -hmm. this has become, you know, at least in the United States, more of a pressing issue than it was previously. Europe, of course, has paid more attention to this um, for a longer time, but, um, you know, I, I see it, I guess, I see the challenges of the transition more in terms of economic development issues, right? And so inequities between developing and uh, and wealthier economies, and then uh, you know differences and in inequities between oil importers and exporters, um, and you know these these inequities are just the, the gaps will be widening, um, and so I think that is really the kind of broader theme about the transition we're heading into. Um, and it says a lot about, you know, where, um, you know, more powerful sources of, uh, of, of energy are, um, you know, more uh, diversity in energy sources um, and in the, in, the, in the sources of potentially funding investment in traditional hydrocarbons, but also in these, in these new technologies, whether it's green hydrogen or more solar production or even more nuclear production. Um, and that pull is going more towards the emerging market developing economies. That's where the action is. That's where the activity, that's where the demand is. That's where the, I think the possibilities for, um, uh, for you know, a lot of the, the, the national oil companies, particularly in the Gulf, are positioning themselves really to be um, uh, the leaders in some of these newer technologies. And I know that uh, some of the earlier conversations you had this week, Valerie and Marcel, I know made this point, I think very clearly as well. So, you know, that that to me is sort of the trend line of the transition is that, um, you know, we're both where energy demand is, where we're gonna see economies growing and where we're gonna see the most active and, and possible um, providers of technologies and solutions is really more in a, a Southern South direction, emerging mm -hmm. market and particularly Gulf, um, Gulf led in, in that respect. And that has political implications, right? Um, uh, it has implications for you know, where the money is and then how that is provided, and particularly within the MENA region. So this I think is 
um, in my own work, something we're you know, very, very closely paying attention to, the ability to share uh, electricity through grid networks, uh, mm -hmm. which is now becoming more of a popular idea because it's seen as potentially also a profitable business to be in, but it comes with it, you know, some pretty serious political ties. So the ability to transfer electricity to Iraq or to Egypt from the Gulf will be very, very important in seeing the dynamics of the Gulf states emerging as more of the center of power, center of wealth, center of renewable energy solutions within the MENA region. Hmm. Let me just follow up, uh, Karen, with one other question on the, the fairness uh, sort of cluster of issues that you've raised. And I'll come back to my uh, original question and give the other panelists a chance to sort of um, tee up some of their um, basic uh, observations about the energy transition. But on the equity issue, is there also a concern that um, it's a people issue that um, if, the, if the transition is, uh, as one analyst has put it, is merely a fast energy transition and not a just energy transition that you risk leaving uh, millions of people in a, um, a future of, uh, I guess you would call it fuel poverty and that this could fuel um, instability? Or is it more what you sort of referred to, uh, a, a sense of equity and um, which economies uh, have sort of a, um, a, a right, so to speak, to continue growing and to have access to, uh, to cheap energy the way economies already fully grown have done over the past five or six decades? Yeah, I mean, the, the, you know, of course, there are power dynamics at play and inequities of wealth among nations. That's, that's our world. It always has been that way. Mm -hmm. But in this particular issue, you know, it's about the, the way that we try to put restrictions on um, the way that growing countries can use uh, fossil fuels. And of course, they're going to say, hey, that's not fair because look how you grew in the Industrial Revolution or hey, look how you uh, right. developed your economies. These are old debates in, in economic development and, and they're still you know, absolutely um, correct to be a consideration. I think the, the, the concern for um, you know, particularly where we're thinking uh, there is uh, energy poverty, most of Africa, we're going to see increase in electricity demand in the next 20 years. Um, you know, the provide the finance to build uh, renewable power plants. It's very simple. And that's in the interest of developed economies. You know, that's in the interest of the wealthier economies to, to see an acceleration in, um, particularly in Africa and in parts of Asia, to get electricity to people, to see their economies grow. That's better for all of us. Like, you know, rising tide raises all ships kind of thing. But that's not necessarily been... Um, where we are in, in the policy. Um, and I think this has a lot to do with um, a bit of confusion within the US and our own sense of energy independence. Um, it's a bit of a, um, uh, an inability to see beyond our own, our own shores. And um, you know, our, our, the growth of the United States is, is certainly gonna be tied to the ability of, um, of emerging markets to, uh, to do better. Thanks, Karen. Um, we can come back to these um, equity issues um, a bit uh, going forward. Um, Lee Chin um, and Kate, I wanted to um, ask you um, about your uh, sort of uh, preliminary observations about major trends in the move to a net zero uh, future, essentially the, the energy transition we're in. Um, Lee Chin, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I think I can quickly mention probably um, two trends off the top of my head. Um, the first one is actually um, probably a, you know, the issue of, um, I think I see some kind of a rivalry um, between different institutions with regards to how are you going to count, right? And, and count, I mean, how are you going to count carbon offsets, right? Um, how are you going to count how much methane has been released? Uh, how are you going to count how much carbon has been released, carbon, carbon emissions? Mm -hmm. Who is going to do the counting? If you talk about hydrogen, you know, is, is it the Hydrogen Council or is it some other, you know, I, you know the, the IEA or the, the EIA? I mean, 
who is going to do all this counting? Or are there going to be many metrics floating around? We get to pick and choose, and that will even add more to uncertainty. So I think this kind of um, accounting is, is really, really going to be key um, as we move towards uh, within the energy transition. Because like Karen mentioned, um, if companies are, you know, companies who are rich enough, or countries that are rich enough to be able to invest in renewable energy in the South, um, they maybe want to count that as an, as an offset, as a carbon mm -hmm. offset. But equally at the same time, the countries who are benefiting from that would also like to count that as part of the renewable energy. And can you count it twice? I, I mean, I have no idea. So we've got this whole accounting you know, business uh, mm -hmm. as, as one of the major trends, right? And mm -hmm. I think as one of the speakers said yesterday, um, if you don't have a job yet, like you know, just fresh university graduates, going to this kind of carbon or methane accounting, that, that's <laughs> gonna be a really good field to go into. Um, second major trend I can think about as we move into the transition um, is issue of storage, right? So storage is going to be a really, really big trend um, because as um, you know, we all mentioned, there is demand uncertainty, there is some kind of underinvestment uncertainty, there is uncertainty about you know, whether countries have ramped up enough renewable energy simply in the Middle East, they've not you know, done a, a really great job, it's still very low levels of renewable energy here. So storage is going to be really important uh, in order to mitigate some of the volatility that we see, whether in gas or in oil. So storage as in you know, batteries or storage as in um, hydrogen, um, storage is going to be a really key issue here. Um, as we, you know, as we try to get some kind of reduced volatility and also the equity um, in the energy transition. So I'll, I'll just mention these two. Thank you, Li Chen. Um, Kate, um, what no. is your initial take on the energy transition that we and I have a, a question I want to focus on you on it a bit, but uh, let me just leave it open for at first. Yeah, I'll be quick. I mean, basically, it's um, it's it's not evenly um, it's not even the 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 transition pathways. I mean, there are I don't know of very many countries in in the region, the Gulf region, that actually have a transition pathway. Maybe the UAE more than others, and I think we may hear more announcements from Saudi Arabia next week. But you know, if you look, it's trying to find the right balance. I mean, you know, yes, the answer is electrification. But if you look at the percentage of, of renewables in primary energy supply globally, it's still quite tiny. I think Nikos Safos mentioned a, a, a figure of 5%, it's higher in, in electricity. So, but you know, you can't electrify everything and to go from 20% mm -hmm. to 80 to 100%, you know, is going to take a trebling of investments, even if, uh, you know, yes, solar costs have come down, PV costs are down by 80%. And, um, but the problem is getting the, 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 the mix right. And if you look at the UAE, for example, you know, the fact that they now have one nuclear reactor actually operating has dwarfed all their renewable, um, the electricity they generate from renewables. I mean, which is, and they do have quite large um, mm -hmm. uh, solar parks. So that I think is an issue. And if you look at the news today, you know, Saudi Arabia, Australia, Japan, trying to water down this IFCC report about uh, fossil fuels, you know, the need to accelerate the, the, the switch away from fossil fuels because they want to water it down. So I think there's maybe a small window of opportunity where countries, producers, and I think the UAE is among those, the group of, of, of companies that want, the countries that really want to capitalize on the fact that they do have a window of opportunity to use um, you know, the, the price and, and the demand for oil at this present time before we actually see this inevitable peak in demand. Russia is doing quite well. They're getting, you know, they're getting their cake and eating it because you have high oil prices and high gas prices and they're you know, huge supplies of gas to, uh, to Europe. So at the moment, I don't think they have any, any reason to complain. And also um, high coal prices. And yes. Trifecta. Yeah, yeah. yeah hey, let me um, follow yeah. up. Um, the Bahraini Minister of Oil, Sheikh Mohammed, uh, on the first day of the conference, underscored the need to stay focused on the science, as he put it, uh, and to rely mm -hmm. on what is sustainable economically through uh, several multi-year energy cycles of high and low profits. Um, he seemed to indicate that um, there are not enough reliable replacement technologies for oil and gas, at least to absorb their current huge share of the energy market. 
in essence saying renewables remain in their uh, niches. Um, and many, it's not just his view, many people in the industry mm -hmm. and elsewhere share this view. I wanted to get your sense. Do you think this view provides a reliable roadmap to address the energy transition that we face? Is it enough given the scope of challenges on the global warming side, or is it going to get overtaken by other events? Um, I, d I don't think it's good. I mean, one has to be reasonable. Even if you look at the, the, the most um, you know, the most optimistic net zero scenarios, you're still going to have oil in there. You know, maybe gas is going to have a bigger share, but, you know, OPEC's own world oil, oil outlook sees um, the share of, of oil still at about 30 percent, followed by gas. Coal, you know, goes way down. But, you know, hydrogen is still a 2030 um uh, fuel and you, as 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 his excellency minister said, you know, in transportation at the moment, you're not, you know, you you're not going to have total decarbonization. I think Karen mentioned storage. You know, we have to have storage solutions. The wind didn't blow. We had, um, you know, uh, Russia not supplying more than its contractual supplies of gas, and we have, uh, you know, we have sky high record gas prices in, in, in Europe, we have mm -hmm. um, Asia scrambling for LNG. Uh, it's, you know, it, it's, at the end of the day, you know, somebody once told me that the energy market is all about demand and supply. And if you're going to move too fast before the system can absorb it, before you prepare customers, I mean, customers have, consumers have to understand, you know, things are becoming digitalized. Not everybody can, can absorb that. Uh, you're going to have, you know, I was in France yesterday mm. and people are, are already complaining about, about high electricity prices. I mean, they're going sky high and, don't, you know, and France has high nuclear, but because they're buying the gas, it's on the margin, you know, gas is the natural gas is the, um, you know, the, the um, baseload fuel. So you need it because if the wind doesn't blow, the sun doesn't shine, then, you know, you're going to be in the dark and you're going to be scrambling for supplies if you, you know, if you don't make provision for the fact that you are going to need this transition fuel, which is natural gas. Mm -hmm. Yes, methane emissions are a big issue, but, you know, uh, producers are now aware of it. They know that in order to secure a role in, in, in a transitional market, they have to decarbonize. They have to store the, you know, they've got to find a way of stripping it and, avoiding leakages of, of methane, which, you know, are huge in Russia. Uh, the US is one of the biggest emitters, uh, flares in, in, uh, in the world. So, you know, Iraq is the third, which, is, which it's now beginning to tackle. So I think finding the right energy balance and convincing consumers before, because you might have a backlash. I mean, there may be a point mm -hmm. where consumers say, you know, who's going to pay for all this? Um, you know, uh, are we going to have labeling? Am I going to be able to choose uh, or am I going, or is this going to be imposed on me? And I think that's very, very important. You've got to have this conversation. You've got to bring in cities, um, local communities in order for you to have a, a smooth transition and avoid the kinds of, you know, the gilets jaunes that we had in France protests, which, um, which I think, you know, if you maintain this fast paced transition before the system is ready, before your customer base is ready, then you're going to have a very disruptive transition and, and transitions are disruptive by their very nature anyway. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say you've really ripped open a lot of the key issues in this energy um, transition um, cluster of issues that we're talking about. I want to give uh, Karen and Lee Chin a chance um, if they want to uh, respond or um, elaborate on anything uh, that you've said, uh, Kate. Um, Karen, any uh, comments on, on what uh, the, these things that uh, Kate, is, Karen, Kate has just mentioned? Yeah, well, I, I think we're all in agreement, right? I mean, mm. these are, um, yeah, these are the bumps. Have you seen the, the funny meme of the picture of the Tesla pulled over on the side of the road in Saudi Arabia with a, with a diesel generator hooked up to it to charge the battery? I mean, this is, this is the moment. And it, I think, you know, the policy, um, you know, consensus is not, quite uh, gelled yet, um, mm. but there is this drive in terms of consumer taste um, and investor preference and the labeling of investments. I mean, there's a whole lot that's, you know, you could say is really about, uh, about the packaging. Um, and so we're, we're in, in that kind of difficult moment and it's, it's, it's generational in some ways, it's very different across different uh, polities and mm. in different regions. 
Um, so, you know, the, I think the real work is, uh, is again, what COP26 is all about, the sort of consensus building process, um, and then figuring out the tools, which I think Lee Chen described very accurately, um, you know, of the measuring, right, and of the taxing and of the, um, you know, of the regulatory regimes that will have to go along with the production of new technologies and the manufacturing of, uh, of solar panels, and then of the, you know, what takes a long time and a lot of money to build whole lot of new power plants. I mean, just, you know, the Saudi announcement on its own, 50% renewable electricity generation, um, and just about 10 years from uh, less than 2%, uh, or even less than 1%, really, is, um, is just gargantuan, right? I mean, you don't just snap your fingers and there's a new power plant, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's really, this is big work. It's very expensive. It's difficult. Um, and so our, I think we need to temper our expectations, I suppose, mm -hmm. um, and, and get, uh, I don't know, more comfortable with the idea that yes, oil and gas are going to be with us for a while. Um, but there are different kinds of oil and gas. And this is again, where I think some of the Gulf states, particularly Saudi Arabia and the UAE have an advantage mm -hmm. because they can say, we have oil production that is relatively very clean. Um, and we're very careful about, you know, there's not a lot of flaring that's going on in Saudi Arabia compared to what you see in, in other places. Um, and so the kind of uh, designer oil will be, you know, part of our future. And we all probably should get a little more comfortable with that. Li Chin, anything you'd like to respond to in that um, sort of presentation of the issues that set piece that uh, uh, Kate did? Um, no. Uh, well, I just want to mention one thing, which is mm -hmm. what I'd like to actually see uh, in terms of, you know, you talk about some technologies, mm -hmm. um, coal use in Asia, right? It's, it's really, really high coal use in Asia. And that's going to be one of the stumbling blocks, I suppose, um, to the global energy transition, um, because coal is a big source of fuel, whether it's in China, whether it's in Japan, whether it's in Southeast Asia. So I guess one thing I'd like to see in terms of technology um, is actually, you know, someone or some company who can actually do a retrofit, right, of, of coal plants. So, you know, if you can somehow persuade um, um, in Asia that there is a business case to actually, you, you may should convert coal plants into, um, you know, maybe natural gas plants or something like that, which is a bit cleaner, um, that, that would be, that would go some way towards it. And as Karen mentioned, yes, that that's an, that's gas is still a fossil fuel, but at least it's a different kind of, of fossil fuel from coal, right? So it's, it's not as polluting. So I think we all do have to accept that there's some role somewhere in some countries for some kind of fossil fuel, but it's it's how to get it cleaner, um, which is I suppose the key in in the less developed countries. But in the more developed country, then you have to go green. Right. So, so there's different kinds of um, responsibilities and, and, and choices going forward. Uh, Karen, we have a, a question from the audience about, I guess um, we could refer to it maybe as the sticks bag. Um, how, how effective do you think some of these tools are uh, more as disincentives, um, like uh, the EU's proposed carbon border tax tariffs of a sort on energy exports? Um, and uh, high carbon products from countries with high emissions levels? Um, or, or are there other uh, sticks, so to speak, that could force at least the pace of, uh, of change and transition? Well, I mean, I think the, the market forces are probably the, the best incentives that we have, and that's, that's already been happening. Um, and it's, you know, created a little bit of a, a of, labeling issues when we think about what qualifies as an ESG investment and that's created a whole sort of bandwagon effect. But it's interesting how I think we're gonna see the, the greening of oil producing economies um, in, this, in this effort, right? And so, you know, what happens in Saudi Arabia if they make a net zero, zero target announcement mm -hmm. um, will be really interesting because how do you make the business case, uh, as Lee Chin said, for the greening of, uh, of an oil producer? Um, and I think what Saudi Arabia is likely to do is um, to sort of compartmentalize 
um, and say, yes, we're going to continue our oil and gas production. But look over here in Neom, we have a totally green, you know, no emissions uh, city and we're mm -hmm. using uh, green hydrogen and we're using electric vehicles. So there will be this um, sort of provision to the market to say, yes, this is mm -hmm. a, a place where you can come and be an investor and, and build a hotel and be part of this, um, you know, this uh, green economy, but at the same time, keep business as usual in some other product. So, I mean, that doesn't answer your question on terms of uh, European uh, carbon tax schemes, but um, but it, it has to do with where, where investment dollars will be willing to go. And I think that's one way for oil producing countries to kind of Square the circle and get get around some of those restrictions. Um, now, in terms of you know where where we have a, a a global kind of carbon tax agreement, we're I think we're so far away um, from measuring and implementing you know that kind of policy, um, and and that's just it to me. It just seems you know decades away before we'll be able to really do that. So the the better source is is the kind of market incentive, I would say, and th and that is happening. Mm -hmm. You consider, um, Karen, in terms of market incentives, um, like investor uh, pushes, um, shareholders demands for greener uh, things or, um, you know, efforts like that as market? Absolutely. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, it's in the, the way we categorize investments. It's the way that uh, the public uh, companies are, are um, being pushed into um, into new businesses and, and offloading some of their mm -hmm. uh, their assets. Um, and, and those assets will get picked up, right? I mean, there will be new companies that form that are willing to, um, you know, to take what BP or Shell or, or, um, or Chevron has to sell, particularly in, in the MENA region. And, and, you know, that, that could be positive. Um, so it's, you know, I think that's, that's more of what we should be embracing as opportunities, maybe of the loosening up of some of these um, these production areas um, to to maybe newcomers. Of course, there will be IOS, uh, um, sorry, national oil companies that will also be able to scoop up some <laughs> some mm -hmm. of these assets. But uh, but you know, it's it's in some ways it's an opening um, of the uh, of the competitive landscape, and I, I think that's always positive. Thank you, Karen. We have a, a question, um, Etienne, I think I might um, uh, put it to you, a, a version of it. Um, we, we started out uh, the panel today talking about OPEC plus. Um, there's a, a question now about we're in this energy transition. How well is OPEC plus positioned to be the leader for the oil producing countries in it? Or is OPEC plus really more focused on short in intermediate term supply and demand issues in um, these oil producing countries for the next, if you're looking at a longer phase, 20, 25 years are really gonna be on their own, um, managing their own transitions. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, well, I think uh, whether it's OPEC plus or just OPEC alone, um, I, I think, you know, in general, it's very hard for international organizations to actually wither away and, and die, right? That, that's an international relations kind of thing. So I think that um, OPEC, OPEC plus or OPEC will survive in some form. And yes, they will try to, you know, obviously help their members. But I think that for oil producers, um, it's, you know, you've got three kind of like options, right? As you go through the energy transition, you can produce like crazy, uh, mm -hmm. which is what some of them are, you know, are doing um, uh, ahead of any, you know, green plan that, that comes in. So it's the green paradox where you, you see it coming and so you just produce like crazy. Um, your second option is to diversify like crazy. Um, so you diversify into non-oil stuff like what the Gulf states are doing. Um, you, the state helps them by, say, providing export credit, which is what the UAE has, is doing to, for the master, for example, so that they can um, export their renewables business overseas. And the third option is, I guess, you would resist like crazy um, the, the, the oil, the, the energy transition, the transition away from oil um, by, you know, putting up roadblocks, by, you know, just trying to be a, as obstructionist as possible, but still being seen to be a good citizen. So I guess there's these kinds of three kind of roles that, 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 um, that uh, oil uh, countries within OPEC can play. Not all of them can do one or all three, 
but I think in general, um, you know, OPEC would, I, I guess, you know, I, I don't think that they, they would disagree um, that you would either have to produce that crazy diet or supply that crazy or resist. Um, I think they're doing all three, OPEC or OPEC plus as an organization. So yeah, I, I think that they will exist, continue to exist in, in some form rather than wither away. Kate, um, Glasgow is coming uh, in 10 yep. days. Um, countries are going to get together to discuss this uh, energy transition, more focused on the other side of the, uh, the Gulf, so to speak. The, I mean, the, the, uh, the uh, idea Gulf uh, from the climate change uh, side of, of things. Um, and taking into account what Karen said about the importance of, of, and I think you also alluded to it about that the really important incentives are market incentives. What is the importance of um, efforts like um, COP26 and um, these um, goals that they set, trying to keep warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius um, for the extended future? Um, does that also have a, a, a place to to uh, a role to play and can it be effective? What's your sense of uh, Glasgow and the role it might have? Um, I mean, I think Paris set the, set the tone. Previous climate agreements were really just, you know, sort of gatherings that came out with, with, with ambitious, the, the, it was a, a lot of talk, but nothing really started moving. I think Paris was the landmark agreement that actually got you know, the realization that climate change was actually a, a major issue. And of course, we had in the interim, we had the US pull out. So that kind of weakened the, 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 uh, the issue. The fact that China has now come on board and, and has announced its 2060 um, target, net zero target, maybe even reaching peak emissions by 2025, which may be a bit too ambitious if they're now switching to coal. But I think that, you know, if now that you have the US on board, and hopefully it will remain so, and China, you've got these big, you know, major consumers. Um, India is a bit more difficult because they have, uh, you know, they, they need a lot of coal. But I think Glasgow is, is when, and, you know, let's not forget that these um, national um, uh, targets are actually voluntary. You know, they're not binding yet. Right. So I think you need to have binding targets. You need to have proper measuring. And we don't have that yet. You know, there's, as, as Karen said, there's all these... Um, different organizations that are, you know, saying they want to monitor methane emissions, you know, you've got satellites, you've got all kinds of, uh, of methods, but nothing is, it's not universal at the moment. So I think binding targets, and then you're going to get more um, ambitious targets being set in Glasgow. I mean, you're going to have 25,000 people descending on this very small place. And um, I was asking the question, I think in the first session, it was like, we have emissions are rising, even though people aren't flying that much, you know, we still have limited mobility. Yes, we have this surge, you know, as the economy's opened up. But uh, I think you might see a, a tiny blip as all these people jet in. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how they can, you know, again, it's all about governance. It's all about mm -hmm. setting the targets, but also proper monitoring. And, and I think that's, you know, that's the way forward. And you will see some resistance from, as, as we saw today in the news, you know, leaked uh, emails that showed that, uh, the leaked documents showing that Australia of all people and Japan, which is quite strange for Japan to be resisting it. Um, uh, you know, the, the sort of speeding up fossil fuels, I think. And the other danger is that there, there's been the demonization of all hydrocarbons, you know, fossil fuels being lumped together. Coal is more polluting, obviously, followed by oil. But again, uh, as other speakers mentioned, it is not as carbon intensive to produce oil in Saudi Arabia and, and, um, and uh, the UAE than it is in, in, in Russia, for example. So it's... Um, but there is a demonization of it. And I think they have to get the message across that, yes, we are decarbonizing, we will be investing in carbon capture and storage. I think there's an announcement next week coming up uh, on the circular carbon economy. And we are a carbon economy, you know, we're a carbon world, we're made of carbon. So you can't suddenly eliminate um, the basic structure of humanity. So I think mm -hmm. the messaging has to be that, yes, we are going to need all kinds of fuels. Oil isn't going to be phased out overnight but we have to find a way to clean it up, to green it. As, as Karen said, I think designer oil is, is, is the way forward, but you have to get that message across. And I think that's, that's missing at the moment. And then you have to have 
a, a sort of, you've got to have a global governance body that is going to oversee um, this transition. Um, and make sure we don't do what the Europeans have done in the past. Is that you know you set a target, you miss it; you set a higher target. And I think that's where, it, well, but that, and that's exactly what's happened. You know, um, uh, if you remember, you know, you go back to Japan, which was one of the first countries to to, to host a, a climate summit, and nothing's happened since then. So I think that's it's an important one to remember. Uh, Kate, while I have you, um, could I get you just to address the issue? Um, as some have termed it, the issue of winners and losers in the energy transition, um, that not all uh, national oil companies are created equal, so to speak. Um, how do you think the emerging energy transition is going to separate winners and losers um, and, or, or in other ways? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the well-managed companies, you know, the Saudi Aramcos who have, you know, who poured a lot of money into research and development, who are well-managed, the likes of Adnoc, which is, uh, you know, they're now, uh, they're now becoming leaner, more, uh, they're behaving more like, inter like international energy companies than they are state companies. Mm -hmm. uh, but the fear is, and yes, uh, they're the smaller ones who, you know, you've got Venezuela, Pedavesa, which is in, in big trouble. They're not going to be among the winners unless you've got a, you get a totally different political landscape in, um, in Venezuela, which isn't very likely, which isn't looking like at the moment. You've got, uh, you look at countries like Libya, where they had a very able um, head of the national oil company who managed throughout this whole crisis to keep production steady. He's just, you know, been removed because it became politicized. But I think the danger is if you, if you eliminate these companies that are well managed, that know how to run a decent business, who should be part of the solution because mm -hmm. they've got the technology, they've got the ability to manage these mega projects and you get the cowboys coming in and mm -hmm. picking up those cheap assets. Uh, and not really, you know, following the rules, then I think that's, you know, there's a risk of a breakup. So I think that's, um, you know, they, you've got to have everybody sitting together at, at the table rather than, you know, this pull and push of no fossil fuels are bad, so you're out of the picture. You can't be, you know, it's uh, it's too big an industry to be. And I think what, what the uh, NOCs are going to have to do is follow the example of the IOCs and even the IOCs who have now declared their net zero targets, they, they're going to be, you know, carbon neutral businesses, they're finding it difficult to adapt, mm -hmm. you know, they, they're realizing how difficult it is, because it's like, you know, turning a tanker around mm -hmm. in rough seas. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, Karen, the, you referred to the, or, or we talked together about the issue of uh, uh, shareholders and climate activists uh, forcing the hand of, of some of the international oil companies. What do you think will force the hand of the national oil companies? Or is there going to be a lot of, of them just op acting opportunistically, so to speak, to absorb the space that has been left by the, the international oil companies that have now become energy companies and are trying to um, decarbonize uh, much at a much faster pace? Well, I think for the the big NOCs in the Gulf, the Adnox and the and the Aram, Aramco, for example, it's not that they're going to grab up, um, you know, the business of of Exxon or or Shell necessarily. They'll have their own incentives to change, and this is what I mean by paying it to OPEC plus and OPEC and all the producers will be paying more attention to where the demand is and where the growth is. And that's really in emerging markets, right? And mm -hmm. so those are the, the political ties that they want to make. Those are the inroads they want to make in terms of, um, you know, being a potential source of, um, of electricity production, of, uh, you know, being in, in the full scale energy business in the same way that uh, you see a BP or Total trying to be. But their, their motivation will be for paying attention to their consumers. And their consumers are closer around them. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly in Asia, but also I think Africa will become incredibly important for, uh, for Gulf national oil companies as a site of some of that new energy business they want to be in. Um, and so that's, you know, that's great, right? They will survive that way and they will be very efficient at it and very profitable at it, I imagine, as well. Um, so, you know, that's an opportunity. Um, 
I was going to say something else from from Kate's last comments, and it Please. slipped my mind a little bit. But um, you know, I think we're you know we're still very much in agreement there. The the kind of issue on the um, the inequities, or you know, who who's the winner and the loser. I mean, there's you know there's a whole lot that that's still kind of yet to unfold, and I think it's still very much dependent on where our growth together globally goes, right? And so that mm -hmm. you know, this moment, you know, is particularly a, a bit unstable because, um, you know, we're, we're perhaps going to a place where um, a lot of what we do in, uh, in the world gets getting more expensive. All right. And that it's going to mean that the cost of borrowing is also going to get more expensive soon. And so, you know, we're, we're in, we're in a bit of a, um, a tight spot. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Li Chen, um, we're all, or all of our panelists, we're coming to the end of our time, but uh, let me ask you a quick question. Um, uh, Sheikh Mohammed in his remarks uh, on uh, Tuesday uh, highlighted uh, the problem of, uh, I guess you call it underinvestment in the petroleum sector. Um, and he attributed some of it to the drive to net zero. And he expressed concern that it could have dire consequences for the, for the industry um, that, that is in serious need, as he put it, of capital investment. Um, others like the OPEC Secretary General have made similar observations. Do you think they're right or um, are we headed for a problem of uh, underinvestment and um, a risk to supply in the, in the future? Thanks for the question. Um, yeah, um, apart from the two you mentioned, um, Igor Sechin, who's the boss of um, Rosneft in, in, in Russia, also mm -hmm. made the same point, right, about underinvestment. So, uh, I mean, this is what... I don't think they are wrong, but this is what I call the resist like crazy argument, right? You try to resist, um, try to, to, to point the finger at somebody else for, for the problem, but definitely there also is, I mean, we have to admit that there is a, you know, a problem with underinvestment. Uh, um, because you know, with all the demand and uncertainty, you can't blame the oil companies, national, international, for not taking the big step. You know, doing the final investment decisions, you know, and going for the um, the big investments that are needed. So, but that's also a function of demand uncertainty. Um, so, um, I, I think that there is some truth to it. And, um, but of course, um, as Karen mentioned earlier, there are a whole lot of other reasons for why there are, you know, high oil or even high gas prices um, that have nothing to do with, with, with underinvestment, right? Um, subsidies is, is one thing. So, so there's a whole lot of other reasons. Um, if I think about what's the, solu what's the solution for that? Well, yes, I do like free markets, but I think in some cases, um, rather than having just an invisible hand, I think we do have to have I guess, um, if you like to call it a helping hand, right? Mm -hmm. Not a grabbing hand, but a kind of helping hand that the state has to play because you know, it has the resources for the resource rich state, it has the resources. And so some kind of a helping hand, whether it's to the South or, you know, um, I think that probably has to come in um, a little bit more. Um, so in that sense, um, when you talk about CBAM, like you asked whether it was a stick, uh, will, uh, Bill, you just asked that. Yes. Um, I think for Russia's case, um, the CBM was actually, I think it's actually pushed Russia into, mm -hmm. you know, announcing its carbon neutrality goal by it was 2060. Um, before right. that, they were kind of, you know, uh, you know, a bit um, ambiguous about their, their commitments. So I think in that sense, CBAM can push not just Russia, but even the Gulf states. Um, to 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 bit, be a bit more ambitious with regards to their carbon goals, um, because the Gulf states also export you know fertilizer and steel and aluminum to to Europe. So in that sense, it forces them um, to be you know, to consider um, their, their carbon levels and their scope three emissions and, and things like that. Thank you, Li Chen. Um, we've almost exhausted our time, uh, Kate. I, I did want to mention um, your reference in your. Uh, scene setter to the IEA's May report. Uh, you described it as a shock to the system, and, and it is pretty stark, some of the points that it makes about to meet the 1.5 degrees Celsius goal, um, energy producing countries are going to need to leave 60% of oil and gas reserves unextracted and 90% of coal reserves. Um, I'm, I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, and um, I wonder, we have about maybe a minute apiece, if uh, any of you have 
um, a closing observation uh, you want to make. Um, Kate, I'd appreciate any observation on this IEA uh, May report, and then we'll go to um, the other panelist. Yeah, I raised, I mean, I, having worked at the IEA, it, it was a, even a few years ago, this, you know, they, the, the, um, the world energy outlook was a totally different animal because they did, they did have the sustainable um, development scenarios, but, you know, it's moved on since then because even they have, uh, and when it, when it came out, I was actually quite surprised because it was quite stark. It didn't actually say you've got to stop investing. It just said that if you were going to, um, if you wanted to reach the 1.5 right. or if you wanted to keep global warming and reach your net zero targets, then you don't need to invest anymore. But at the same time, you know, when when we had the gas crisis in 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 Europe, um, the IEA was calling on on Russia to to you know to provide more gas. We had the White House calling on OPEC to give more oil. So I think you know it just shows how disjointed the whole the whole situation is. But um, I think it's uh, the, that report was actually done in sort of as a as a as a roadmap as a. Uh, you know, in preparation for COP26, so it wasn't really. Um, but I, I think it's uh, it, it's also, it was dismissed as, you know, la la land fantasy by, by Prince Abdelaziz bin Salman, the Saudi oil minister. I don't think they're very happy with it, but then mm. some members of the IEA are not very happy with it either. Mm. So I think it was uh, maybe just trying to show the, the urgency of the climate crisis. I mean, this year we saw massive, we saw heat waves, we saw flooding in China, we mm -hmm. saw fires in California, you know, in, mm -hmm. in Greece, in, in, in North Africa. So I think we're seeing evidence of it now. So you can't deny the fact that we are in a climate emergency. And whether it's man-made or not, you've got to take action. I think that's where the argument is. Is it man-made? Is it, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and it's not just, you know, and the energy industry is one of the biggest emitters. So we've got to admit that. Thank you, um, Kate. Um, Karen, I know you may have to leave uh, fairly uh, sharply. Um, any final observation in a minute? Oh, I'll just say thank you for, you know, holding these discussions over three days. I think we need to do more of this. And uh, uh, it's really good to be able to learn from Lee Chen and Kate. I think they had a, a lot of great points today. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Lee Chen? Um, no, nothing for me. Um, I was just going to say that my favorite uh, outcome of the IA report was the the La La Land reaction. Um, but you know that 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 just again emphasizes my point about the you know it's it's the resist like crazy you know strategy that you know this is um, you know part of the you know that the modus operandi uh, among other things. So that's all. Thank you, Li Chen. Well, on behalf of the uh, Arab Gulf States Institute here in Washington. I wanna thank our wonderful panelists for sharing um, your wonderful expertise today. I'd also like to thank all of you out there in Zoom land for attending and closing out our event on Petro Diplomacy Conference. Uh, I hope next year our conference will be in person. And a special thanks to Raymond Karam and Busha Lawrence at AGSIW for their tremendous work putting this event together. Uh, thank you all again and look forward to seeing you at our next events. Thank you. <laughs>